pure fentanyl, it is fire. Like, it is so dangerous. It's like the most horrid, wretched, pure terror you can imagine. And it feels like something slowly, like, just pulling your life force out of you. And then you get tunnel vision, starts getting smaller and smaller. And around this tunnel, it's just darkness, right? And then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and closes. And then it goes, you're dead. That's it. You think you're dead? No, you're dead. You're a flat line, no heartbeat, dead. Vancouver, a city renowned for its natural beauty. A quote from the tourist board. But beneath the mountain vistas, the city has a tragic underbelly. Despite being known as one of the world's top three cities in which to live, a tiny neighborhood known as Downtown Eastside is experiencing a huge drug problem. Thousands of lives have been lost and in nearly nine out of 10 autopsies, a deadly new illicit drug has been present. The painkiller fentanyl is now the number one killer drug in the US. You can die just by touching it. Fentanyl. 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 A fatal dose of fentanyl. 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 The potent opioid that's supposed to tranquilize elephants. A synthetic painkiller 100 times more powerful than morphine. Just two milligrams of the pure drug, which is about four grains of salt, is enough to kill the average adult. Prince died from a lethal amount of the painkiller fentanyl. A 10-year-old boy in Florida has become one of the youngest. Overall, more than 63,000 people died of monster drug, drug kills far more people than gun violence. And if you don't know what fentanyl is, it is basically the new heroin, but much, much stronger. It's unregulated substance, and we're the ones dying. Life down here. Hey, what's up, bro? Not a whole lot. I'm on a documentary right now, brother. <laughs> I'm on a documentary here talking about opioid use and shit. <laughs> yeah. I'll come talk to you in a minute. Hey, wait down here. I got to talk to you, bro. Just give me a minute. Yeah. There's another, another fellow bro in the hood, you know? Um, friend of yours? Yeah, a good friend of mine. Dina? No, no that doesn't matter. <laughs> Ask no, ask no questions, I'll tell no lies. Here in downtown Eastside, addiction is nothing new. Heroin has flowed through Vancouver's ports to this deprived part of town since the 1970s. But market forces have seen that heroin supply replaced. Fentanyl is stronger, cheaper, and much less bulky to import. Where are we going, Kevin? Where would you like to go? Uh -huh. Do you want to see what it's really like? Sure. Let's go. Let's go. This is East Hastings Street now. This is where the ghetto starts, basically. What you're looking at is the mecca of drug addiction. We have been an active narcotics hub for Ever since I can remember, maybe that's why I came here. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that is probably why I came here. Illicit fentanyl hasn't flooded the street drug supply outside North America yet. Do you think this could become a global problem? And if it does, what should people expect? Death. Lots of fucking death. People are going to die, and, and it's not going to be pretty. It is wildfire. People will try it, love it, and they'll never quit. These, these streets were crowded. You're talking about 1,500, 2,000 people died just in this, this block. Mama put my guns to the ground. Our government knows what's killing them. Now, I've seen our government address an epidemic before, SARS. They spent multiple, multiple millions of dollars to, to keep us safe from SARS. Any idea how many people died from SARS? I know, 14 people died from SARS. 
We lost 14 people last fucking week, right? This is a huge problem. The United States lost 72,000 people in overdose death last year. Canada lost 8,000. All right, these are, these are large numbers of people dying of a preventable death, and it will not be any different in Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, anywhere in the Western world. It's just, uh, it's inevitable, it is. I mean, this stuff will kill you. If I wanted to buy fentanyl right now, how easy would that be? Well, it would pretty much be simple for you to get fentanyl. It'd be impossible for you to get heroin because that's what, it's all fentanyl now. Even if there is heroin, it's got fentanyl in it. How far do you reckon we are from a drug dealer? Feet. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. One drug dealer or a lot? A lot. <laughs> a lot, but, you know. What's your name, buddy? Sylvester. And what are you doing hanging out on the street corner here, Sylvester? Uh, selling, selling fentanyl, you know, trying to get by. I live on the streets, so I gotta make a living somehow. I don't want to rob stores or nothing. I've got about 10 years in the pen. This way here, I stay out. And how's business? Are you selling a lot? Booming, man. Like, you, you can never have enough. So how many people are buying fentanyl from you each day? 100, 150. Every day? Every day. Is the dealing here quite organized? Is there like a bit of a kind of chain of command to it? Yeah, different gangs run different alleys. I'm on a 12 hour shift. How do you get that job? Because I don't think they're advertising that in the newspaper, right? No, no. It's through connections, mostly coming out of jail. What's fentanyl done to the community around here? Destroyed it. I lost like 40 people that I know well close to me in the last three years. People never did drugs in their life, picked it up once, dead. From fentanyl? From fentanyl. Is it possible any of them got that fentanyl from you? It's possible. That bother you? To an extent, but they're gonna get this from somebody, right? I mean, I guess apart from anything else, it's not great business practice to be killing your customers, right? No. I don't think anybody wanted anybody to die, but the thing is, heroin, it used to come and it's heroin. This fentanyl, we're making it ourselves. You go online on the on the dark web, you order an ounce of fentanyl from China. It costs you 350 bucks, pay an extra 50 bucks, the next day is delivered right to your door. You take that four hundred dollars worth of fentanyl, yeah, and you make a thousand grams of down, yeah, and you're getting anywhere between one hundred and one hundred twenty per gram. So do the math. Jesus, it's like mining diamonds, isn't it? Yeah, it's like gold. You're taking four hundred dollars and you're making a hundred grand. But while it's lucrative, illicit street fentanyl is often being cooked by amateur gangsters in their basements. They're making the recipe up as they go along, and the final product is synthetic and wildly inconsistent. Customers here told us that what they buy on the street can be any color of the rainbow. That's what, like right now, everybody wants the dark green. They come up and ask you, you got the dark green? If you don't get it, they shop around. Why do they want that? Because that's yeah. the highest fentanyl. But that's also the shit that's killing people, right? Yep. You're playing Russian roulette. And people are comfortable to take that risk. As soon as they know that that stuff's dropping people, they're running to you. Who got that green stuff? Because yeah. they think they can, they're the ones that can take half of it or a quarter of it. Or... And if people are dying from it, then it must be good shit. Is that the logic? That's the logic. Last night, this girl just came out of detox, and I knew she just got back. She's all healthy and everything. She sees me, oh, Sylvester, come running up. Give me a point. I said, you just got out, didn't you? I just got out two hours ago. I said, what do you want a point for? Oh, I'm just gonna use a little bit of it and have some for tomorrow. I said, don't use it all, because you know, you know your tolerance is, no, no, I won't. 10 minutes later, the ambulance in the alley, they were working on her. I don't know if she lived or died. I don't know. Ambulance come, please come, I leave. So how much do you sell it for, and what do people get from it? $10 for a flap. Can I see? That's a $10 flap of fentanyl. And that's dark green? Dark green. That's the shit that's dropping people. Do you know what purity that is? 
15% fentanyl, 3% heroin. The rest is baby laxative, sugars. Is it possible that I'd die if I took that? Yep. All depends how high your immune system, you know, your tolerance. I mean, I've never taken fentanyl before. If you took that, you'd die. 100%? 100%. And if I bought the same quantity of heroin with you, would I die? No. Definitely not? Definitely not. Would you sell it to me? If you want to buy it. If I want to buy it? Like, if I give you 10 bucks for that, now you'll sell me that? Yep. It's your life, bro. You gotta make your own choices, right? And I gotta eat. So. Just like that, man. The candid way in which Sylvester discusses his day job is conflicting. It's easy to judge him, but the reality is that fentanyl has become normalized in downtown Eastside. And for the homeless community who live here in desperate hardship, it's one of the very few tradable commodities. Vancouver is a very rich city, surrounded by you know, very rich real estate. And unlike most Canadian cities, Vancouver has decided to ghettoize poverty. As the city gentrifies, people get squished and squished. And it used to be 15 square blocks. Now it's down to six or seven square blocks of people. And uh, most of them are in search of some sort of drug from day to day. So just a block over that way, I just purchased this. Could that be fentanyl? I think it could be. I mean, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. Where do you think that ambulance is going to that we can hear behind us? Probably an overdose, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, this, I mean, it's, a, it's surprising it's the first one we've heard because there's uh, multiple overdose calls in this little community per day. And some, sometimes it's just been horrific. Like, it's just been, just wall-to-wall -wall ambulances and fire trucks and people lying on the street, and it can look like a war zone. People are being slaughtered down here at numbers that are just offensive, and nobody gives a slaughter. This is the war zone. No, you're, you're, you're in it right now. Like, you think Afghanistan is bad. This is an unregulated substance, and we're the ones dying. The capital of the opioid crisis. This right here was my last $10 and my only $10 that I sold a crowbar and an angle grinder for. I got a coffee and some dope. Yeah, usually you don't eat and you live, breathe and work for this. <laughs> How can you know really what's inside that? So I guess it's fentanyl. He's also got the powder version there. It, oh, like you never know what you're gonna get. It's a surprise all the time. So these are both fentanyl, but it almost looks like a different drug. It does. You never know. Like, it always looks different. It's just, uh, one big fuck around. Really is, sorry for the language, but it's, um, you know, food, clothes, shower, drugs. It's constant. Take a walk on the wild side, shall we? Why did you call it the wild side, Spike? There, there seems to be an idea here that it might be dangerous down here, or it might be, uh, yeah. Mainstream society is a little bit of a, uh, intimidated by it or, or afraid of it. I'm, and yeah, so I said it in jest because it's not the wild side at all. It's just a, it's a neighborhood of people that. Uh, are going experiencing a lot of pain and, and dealing with a lot of trauma and what kind they, of pain do people typically go through? Well, it, it, high poverty area. There's 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 all kinds of uh, people people survive all kinds of trauma from early childhood abuse to 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 you know relationship pain to you know just yeah just people have gone through a lot down here. 
Do you think addiction is a disease and is an illness? Definitely. You know, what mm. starts out as an original choice to use substances to self-medicate from the pain turns into a lifetime of suffering, and, and I became dependent on using um, heroin and fentanyl because reality was, was painful. Opioids like heroin and fentanyl belong to the same pharmaceutical family as morphine. And like morphine, they were intended for pain relief. Everyone in this self-medicating community has a backstory, and pain, both physical and mental, is all around. Is this person OK? Um, we'll, we'll check right now. I, I'm sure they're probably breathing, but hey, how are you? I'm fine. Cool. Uh, we're, we're filming the wall, but uh, we, won't, we won't, OK? Cool. Sorry to inter sorry to sorry to come into your space, ma'am. I, I had an ugly childhood, so I I, I dabbled. Um, yeah, I, I was running away from things from an awful lot of pain when I was a kid, and I I, I used narcotics. Uh, I cleaned up. In 1997, I cleaned up to raise my child. I was a, his mother killed her, killed herself, and I raised my I was a single dad. I raised my child, my son, and and. Uh, because I, I owed him a life, and, and I have an amazing son. He, uh, he turned out exceptionally well. I did it, I'm really proud of the job that I did. Uh, and then I had an accident, and it kind of brought me back. Um, I got hit from behind on my bike. I broke my legs, my pelvis, my hip, my ribs, ripped my rotator cuff, crushed both hands, broke my back in four places, my skull in four places, my face, my nose, my teeth, with a shearing brain hemorrhage. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a good day in my world. If I'd have met you down here 10 years ago, what would the difference have been? No. Oh, yeah, you would, you'd have probably, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have met me. <laughs> if you would have met me, I'd be apologizing right now. So, uh, completely different What person. would you be apologizing for? Oh, uh, probably for something that I'd done to you or, or taken from you. Or, but yeah, I'd inject drugs 30 to 40 times a day. I mean, so, wow. yeah, I mean, just uh, the shell of the, you know, a person that was just... How much was that costing? Oh, probably a good uh, 600 bucks a day. Fentanyl is now sweeping through North America at a horrifying rate. Since it hit the streets, drug overdose has become the leading cause of death for those under 50. You can't find anyone in these alleyways who hasn't lost a loved one. It's scary how commonplace it's become. Have you lost any friends, Michelle? Through, yeah. through this fentanyl shit? Oh my god, my brother. I love my brother. I'm so sorry to hear that. Me too. How did your brother die, Michelle? In fentanyl, yeah. So sorry. <sighs> That's the fentanyl truck there. No, I'm <laughs> Perhaps fentanyl's cruelest trick is the Stockholm syndrome it pushes to its victims. The more it devastates this little community, the more people seek solace in its arms. But here in the hardest hit neighborhood, the very people in the midst of its grip are the ones leading the fight back. Right now we're gonna to go to the Washington Needle Depot. It's peer led and we hand out uh, harm reduction supplies for the community. Peer led means that the people that, the staff that work there uh, use drugs themselves and are part of that community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really important that people from the community are the ones leading it. Hey guys. Hello. Hi cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so double hey. shift, no one showed up for this afternoon, so we're gonna go hit up the East End. Perfect. And we'll, yeah, we got uh, one OD this afternoon, one this morning. Oh uh, man. 55 needles found and some Nar two Narcan kids given out. So. That's your first day. First day, so not bad. That's amazing. All right. Thank you we'll so much. It. We'll hit it hard. You're welcome. Well Take done. Care, See ya. And it was this guy's first day? Yes. And he saved an overdose already? <laughs> yeah. Is that pretty common? Would you have an overdose every day like that? Well, I mean, we, it depends on where the routes are, but downtown east side, it's pretty common. Inside this building, clean injecting equipment is handed to locals through a hole in the wall. The idea is to stop the spread of blood-borne viruses like hepatitis and HIV. It's open 24 hours a day and hands out a million syringes a year. So, Corey, how many needles would you give out in a normal shift? 
Oh, wow. Um, I've gone through, one of these boxes have 500 um, rigs in it, and one day I went through four boxes of rigs. And one shift. Rigs. Yeah, that was a busy day. Why is it so important that people around here can get access to those clean needles? Well, they'll, they'll, use, they'll use whatever they need to use. They'll use a dirty rig that they find. They'll, that's how people get hep C and, and AIDS, right? They'll share rigs. They will use toilet water, puddle water, um, whenever they need to, to use to get water, right? And I guess that water's going straight into their bloodstream, and that does not sound great. Well, can you imagine the diseases in these alleys where people urinate and feces and... You know, this is known as Piss Alley. <laughs> smells like piss, right? From the back of the building, the staff run a mobile response unit working in shifts to reverse street overdoses. So for my shift, I have my vest on. I have a 8.8 Narcan ready to go. I have my bike, my helmet, and I always have extra Narcan on me. So in case I come across multiple overdoses, I'll put that right here right now. Workers like Jen patrol these alleyways, administering life-saving medical interventions. Their secret weapon is naloxone, the fentanyl antidote, commonly known by its brand name, Narcan. Fentanyl is an opiate, and what it does is it shuts down your respiratory system. So pretend that like this, this here, this is fentanyl coming in your system, right? So when you shoot someone up with Narcan, it's like a wall goes up, and so the fentanyl hits the wall, it can't keep on going. The more Narcan you put into the system, the bigger that wall gets. So what you're saying is, is it's actually quite easy to reverse an overdose? Yes, it is. So then, if it's that easy to reverse an overdose, why do we have so many people dying of overdose? Because people are using them by themselves. People are really ashamed about their drug use. You're labeled as a criminal or a junkie or a crackhead. So they use by themselves in, in dark places, you know, like where people can't see them or can't find them until it's too late. If you find someone overdosing, how long have you got? You got three minutes. And that depends. I mean, usually it starts off that their lips are blue, and then you you know, you, you only got so much time to react. If you find them that their face is purple, it means you're staying on death's door. And if you find their face is black, you have like a slim chance of breaking back. So when you do find someone that's OD'd and you're able to turn that around to save their life, how does that feel? Extremely stressful and traumatic. <laughs> um, you know, you remind yourself this is why you do this job. So for myself, personally, in the last two years, I respond to 31 drug overdoses. One Friday, we had 103 overdoses. And then a week later, we had 12 people die in the city of Vancouver. One day. And one day. Cory, how does it feel to work in a place like this where you're saving lives every day? Um, sure you can. Um, it means it means a lot. Um, because I lost uh, my son's father, the love of my life, to a heroin overdose. I like it. It feels good to uh, save a life instead of being just part of the problem, right? So it's kind of being part of the solution. You know, when it comes to addiction, don't be surprised, right? It's a monster. And um, you don't know. They, people don't even know who they are anymore. How's it affected you personally? Oh, we won't go there. <laughs> it's affected me tremendously, right? Changed your life. What do you do? I can get a tube and four pieces of tin foil, please. Yes, of course. Okay. There's one important. Thing. The city of Vancouver has invested millions trying to combat the crisis. And while health responses like this have made some inroads, fentanyl has at times been an impossible challenge for lawmakers. It's become so bad that average life expectancy is officially reducing and a public health emergency has been declared. It's caused a deep mistrust from those in the community here towards those in power. Try to keep the camera on this side of the street, not do much on that side. And... Okay. 
and then tell somebody tells us to fuck off, we'll walk up. British Columbia has four times the landmass of the UK, and yet 7% of all its 911 calls came from these two blocks. There's another one over there, Spike. There's the three police cars up there. They are horrendous. They, you know, people are out here, they're at the lowest they can possibly be, and the police want to fucking grind them a little further into the ground. Like, does it make sense? Not to me. If I'm bleeding to death, I don't want their help. You'd rather just bleed out. I don't want their help. They're not my friends. And, and you know what? I'm sure I've played a part in every single interaction. I, I'm not, yeah, I have a colorful vocabulary, and I'm, I've been known to have a bit of an attitude. However, they're professionals, right? I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm, I'm not a professional, they are. There's always cops somewhere. There's three cars right there. And to be totally honest, I think a lot of it is just like PR to show that they're out there, you know? Because they, they don't give a shit about us. The cops are literally watching them shoot up, and they do not arrest them. They've got a bunch of drugs on them. They do not, because they want to contain it yeah. and keep it away from the city, keep it away from, from where people are spending money. And if the cops had rolled up when you were selling me that fentanyl, do you think they'd have arrested us? No, they tell you to fuck off. They grab me, put me against the wall, search me, take my shit, and tell me to fuck off. They say, go explain that to your boss. In spite of the ill feeling towards them, the police say their approach is based on pragmatism. And it's certainly true that there's open public drug use in full view of them. You guys live on the streets out here? Yeah, we've been in downtown east side for over a year. Is that hard sleeping rough out when it gets to winter here? It's, uh, last night was last very, night was very, cold. very rough. Yeah. No, we got, we, there was rain and uh, the blankets were wet. We had to move um, mm. our... We uh, had weird... Uh, we had weird people, like, watching us and... And we just Watching had, you? Yeah. Yeah, no, there was weird people, like, that came up and just like were standing at the end of a, like the foot of like our bed and he was just staring at us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of creepy. It is creepy. It is, it's very creepy. <laughs> this stuff happens here every single day. Yo, we rapping, Iceberg, cold world, Iceberg, we're fire, yo. We love it, bro, yo, you gotta stay, check this rap, bro. Iceberg, cold world, free, free BDs for you for life. Yo, we in the background, <laughs> we love it, yo, we, yo, free BDs. I don't know what that means. <laughs> How did you guys meet? We met at the library. <laughs> and he... Uh, I ran after her. He chased me. <laughs> yeah. Why did you run after her? Love at first sight. <laughs> yeah, we were, we, were, we, were, we, were in, we were in the library and we were catching eyes. <laughs> and then I laughed, and then and then she laughed, and I saw her walking down the street. And he ran. I said, I cannot let her leave. <laughs> so I ran after her, and I freaked. Uh, and I he freaked her. Up and he's like, "Hey!" <laughs> I'm like, "Whoa!" <laughs> like, but you have to admit, though, five minutes later, we were making out right, yeah. right around the corner. Okay. Right so, there. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's no. Oh. no, not here. But we, 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 we were, were, we did, we did make out like five yeah. minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> Is this person okay over here? Well, no. This is this is this is this the, is normal. This is this is this is totally normal. It's what we call it's what we call the the nod, uh, the nod. or or the uh, the Hastings shuffle. We we've been there. We we've 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 smoked heroin. I overdosed. Recently, like, and, and I had I had somebody narc on me twice. Okay. Saved your life. Yeah. I almost died. His lips were blue. My lips were blue. I was dead. You shouldn't do it Stop anyway. doing drugs altogether. That's why liquor and weed is all The person we need. who that... gave it to us said it was heroin, and it yeah. wasn't. What do you think it was? Fentanyl. It, it was definitely. We didn't even have that much. No. We used to like a dragon. Yeah. Like we were smoking. And I, and I, I was done. A dragon, as in one, you just, just the, inhaled one. Smoking once. it off of a foil. Smoking like, it off of a foil. We each did like one, like, hoot, basically. Yeah. And, and, I, uh, and I basically almost died. From one we, inhalation. One. Yeah. I was freaked out because they said like he was ODing. What would you have done if I died? That would have crushed me.
I don't even want to think about it. How does it make you feel looking back on that day, Stephen, thinking you nearly did? I'll never do it again. Never again. Homelessness in Vancouver is at its highest since records began. And as hardship rises, so does addiction. Across the water on a disused construction site, 300 homeless people are forming a temporary community. The conditions here are brutal but they feel they have nowhere else to go. People are very vulnerable out here. Families with jobs and kids cannot find housing. They're sleeping in tents. It's a total human rights violation is what it is. You know, I've seen refugee camps in other countries. This is exactly what it looks like. We are Canadian refugees. This is a Canadian refugee camp. Mind if we have a look at your tent and see where you're staying? Okay, it's way down here. <laughs> this is my tent. <laughs> I'm embarrassed because it's usually cleaner than this. <laughs> this is my buddy. And here, this is Bruce. <laughs> He's been with me uh, since, since I've been here. <laughs> Yeah, and they got eagle feathers up there. They're saving me, keeping me safe. Yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a mess here, but I golf, so. Oh, you play golf. <laughs> I'm not any Tiger Woods or anything. Okay. But. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Oh, four! <laughs> I think it went in my tent. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it smashed the side of your tent. <laughs> oh, that's all good. I got grandchildren. I haven't seen them for a while. So I have toys out here just to remind me of them, my grandsons, and... Um... And you've actually got Narcan here all around the flower pots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got them hanging all over, right? Because mm. it happens all the time. It's, it's an epidemic. Uh, naloxone. Um, that's the uh, overdose kit. I've had to Narcan somebody 10 times. And one was a husband and wife, actually. We were taking care of her, and he started overdosing, and they were laying kind of head to head, and it, it, they were reaching for each other as they were overdosing, like they knew. For many here, drugs are the only source of comfort. Overdoses are a regular occurrence. But from the roadside at the perimeter of the camp, a small group of activists are helping to reduce the death toll. In here, we have most of our supplies. So we've got our generator, chairs, a table. Um, we've got Narcan. Um, we've got information pamphlets. We've got bottled water that we like to hand out to people. Yeah. Everything you need to keep people alive today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In a few hours, campers will come to this pop-up tent to smoke and inject drugs, including fentanyl, under the watchful eyes of the volunteers, <coughs> safe in the knowledge that if they do OD, someone will intervene. That one's, this yeah, corner's broken, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. <laughs> you know, technical difficulties sometimes. Rather than giving clean equipment for users to take away, the volunteers here invite them into the tent to use their drugs under supervision. But what is the legal status of the tent? It's illegal. Uh, when the police do come by, and they might come by today, we kind of just remind them we're in the midst of an overdose crisis. It's been declared a health emergency by the province of BC. And, uh, you know, we're not here with the intention of breaking the law, right? We're here with the intention of, 
you know, providing people with a safe, supervised space to use drugs and uh, respond to overdoses should they happen. It's an odd situation. Although fentanyl is illegal and the tent is unsanctioned, the medical supplies are directly provided by the health department. In times of crisis, sometimes laws become secondary. In the case of overdose, if fentanyl is the assassin, many believe societal attitudes to the homeless are a key accomplice. Isolation is a big problem. Shame and stigma drive many battling addiction to use alone. There's a lot of hate. You know, people think about junkies, thieves, crackheads. Um, sure, there's that, a lot of thieving and stuff going on, but there's real people here, you know. We get people driving by, throwing bricks, throwing bottles. Very hurtful. A lot of people take it to heart. I try not to, but still do, you know. It does hurt, for sure. I worked many, many years. I pay my way and um, I collect bottles every day. I average 10 to $15 a day. If you make $15 today, let's say, how would you spend it? Uh, 10 of it would probably go to drugs. Fentanyl? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sad, but true, yeah. And why do you do it? What does fentanyl feel like when you take it? Just get a big hug. <laughs> It's, yeah, just a warm place and nothing can hurt you. Homelessness and addiction has caused real damage here. But community life is vibrant and humanity abundant. And in an area of so much intoxication, a sobering thought emerges. How many of these people would not be here if it weren't for naloxone. As night falls, the injecting tent opens for business and the first of the campers arrive. The governments here in Canada support the use of spaces where people can use drugs under supervision. And many that begin life as illegal pop-ups like this one go on to be sanctioned. Across the world, there are more than 100 such centres. Over 30 of those are in Canada, and there's never been an overdose death in any of them. This is Breakfast with the lovely Holly C. And the very charming Jamie Bell. With you till nine from officially the world's best city to live. O-M-G. That's right, folks, number one, and that's official. Hashtag amazing. So my gorgeous Vancouverites, it's another gorgeous crispy morning and it's Friday. And this morning's show is gonna be fry yay. yay. The phone lines are open, and today we're asking what can be done about this pesky opioid crisis. Plus, it's time for you guys to go head-to-head -head on another round of fish or sausage. Bob Burst from the news desk. He's the man with his finger on the pulse. But, well, you take your dope, whatever you got, right? And put it in your little cook pot, and put a little bit of water in it. Take your syringe. It's like filter. Yeah, some people use a filter, some don't. All right, nothing's gonna fit in through the syringe that isn't already gonna get in there anyways. So you going for a vein? Yeah. How does it feel? Uh, uh, great. 
Yeah, that's why I do it. You know, drugs are uh, really what you make of it, man. Like, there's functioning addicts out there, and there's non-functioning addicts, you know? There's people that, uh, uh, like, do drugs until it runs them into the ground, and then they die, and that's it, you know? They're just another statistic. Where are you heading to now, Ronnie? I'm heading down to the mall. I'm, uh... Oh! I'm gonna go, uh... shoplift so I can get some money and, uh... support my habit, because that's what you gotta do these days, man. I fucking feel like shit already, because... there's a $4.25 shot I just did, and, uh... Is it already worn off? It's only a couple yeah. of minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I don't go to fucking jail, like, trying to do it, then maybe I'll get paid and get some more dope, but it's not fun, man. I hate it. Like, I can't stand it, dude. I've spent, like, what over 10 years it? of my life behind bars. Like, for what? A fucking drug addiction? Something that fucking kills me? Like, I know what I'm doing, and I know that it's bad for me, but, like, you know, we've all got our problems, and I'm just trying to cope, man. What's fentanyl done to your life? My life has been absolutely dragged through the mud. I've lost friends, I've lost family members, and I have nothing. I live on the fucking street. I freeze almost every night, and I steal to eat and support myself. I hate my life. I fucking hate it. I wake up in the morning wishing I didn't. That's opioid, drug use, intravenous drug use for you. I feel terrible. I wouldn't wish this on the person. I wouldn't wish living like this for the person I hate most in the world. It's not living, man. It's dying. Like you're running yourself into the ground every day and willingly doing it. And why? because you're too scared to be dope sick or get off the drugs. No, it's because it's, uh, when you've done something for so long, that's all you know, man. All I know is jail and crime and fucking drugs. That's all I know. I'm lost. It sucks. I got a five-year-old son, man. Doesn't know who the fuck his dad is. Some people say that people that use drugs have a choice. You're not choosing this, are you? You don't. Have I'm not choosing this, man. I made. Well, I had one choice, and I made the wrong fucking one. And this is what I deal with now. Do you have hope for the future? Sometimes. I don't know how far my future's gonna go, man. I could be dead 20 minutes from now, who knows? that you see are on the streets is only partially due to the drugs people are taking. It's more to do with what they have to do to get money, to get, keep the economy going, and whether it's uh, sex work or stealing from cars, we could fix that. How? The current crisis is because people are using poison drugs, and I'm at the point now 
where we really need to think seriously about giving people a safer supply of opiates. I'm right in the heart of one of downtown Eastside's worst affected streets. One small medical center is looking to do exactly that. So we're going to go to Crosstown Clinic. And um, what happens at Crosstown Clinic? So um, we provide injectable hydromorphone and injectable diacetylmorphine uh, to clients with severe opiate use disorder. And what is diacetylmorphine? Is um, pharmaceutical made heroin, really. Okay, let's go inside. <laughs> Come on in. That's right, it's a medical center that gives heroin to people in addiction. That door needs to close. There we go. So come on in. So the clients are here for the nurses to do a pre-assessment for them. Sorry, ladies. They enter into this room. They come up to this window here, and they'll give their name, their birth date, and the nurse will provide them or hand them their syringe. Right, can you just pass me a syringe? Thank you. So you can see here that we get, this is the dose. So and it'll tell us the client name and then the drug that they're on. What are you getting there, Dave? Uh, heroin, diacetylmorphine. And how often do you get that? Three times a day. And this is my lunchtime fix. It's another drug transaction in downtown Eastside. But rather than toxic dope sold in a back alley and injected behind a dumpster, it's a regulated pharmaceutical given in a medical setting and supervised by people who care. I'm uh, introducing the heroin into my body now. It is now in there. It's itchy, wah wah. Makes me itchy all over. Like, Serious itchy. I got turned red and uh, get really itchy. But my uh, um, my desire for heroin is met. Is oh, wow, that was good. Prescribing people heroin as a treatment for addiction. It's a challenging concept, but the evidence is persuasive. Switzerland opened a similar center in 1994. And since, they've seen huge reductions in overdose deaths, HIV rates, and drug-related crime. The theory goes that when you take people out of a life of street drugs, they have the chance to introduce routine and make incremental life changes. When people start with us, they're using illicit drugs every day. And by six months in care with us, that goes down to a handful of days a month. Uh, people reconnect with families, uh, they go back to school, uh, they start working, they start working part-time, they, they start housing. volunteering, they get housing. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, my most recidivist patient had been in and out of jail over 200 times before he came to treatment here. And since he's been in treatment here, he's not been back to jail. That's a huge success. How many banks have you robbed? Uh, how many banks have I robbed? Lots. Over 60 banks. I served a prison term of 22 years, two months, and two days. It costs $27,000 a year to supply heroin for one patient here, and it's funded by the government. It's not cheap, but independent research suggests the service saves the taxpayer double that by reducing crime, policing, health care, and ambulance call-outs. And in the midst of a fentanyl crisis, there's a further saving one that's harder to quantify, the cost of human life. We haven't lost any of our clients to a fentanyl overdose because coming here prevents all of that. Are you still robbing banks? No, no, I am very grateful to say that uh, I'm a, a retired uh, bank robber. I no longer need to do that. Our time in Vancouver was up, and the little neighborhood of downtown Eastside disappeared in the rearview mirror. The opioid crisis here in North America is out of control, claiming a life every seven minutes. 
and seeing it up close and personal has been heartbreaking. Heading for home means escaping it. But for how long? I hurt myself today. See if I still feel. We always look at the action. You know, we're so focused on the substance that we've actually forgotten the value of human life. And that's just tragic. But at the same time, these people are beautiful. I got hopes, though. And so, it's powerful. I don't remember the rest. <laughs> Sorry, guys. If you could go back to the day where you first put that needle in your arm, would you do it again? Absolutely not. The day that I put the first needle in my arm, wow. But it took every day of yesterday to bring the man that you see here today. And, and, and the man that you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a good man and I'm, I'm happy with who I am. I still love this woman. They're just a paycheck away. If I make 300 bucks tonight, 50 bucks of it, I put away. I put away, I put away, I put away. I've been doing that now for four years. Another year of this. I'll head over here with 150 grand. Not look back. You gotta stand strong, you gotta keep your chin up, and you gotta keep going, because if you don't, you end up a statistic. A mark in a book, man. Like, you're just another one of those fucking people that died. <laughs>